Walt Disney himself was brought up in a, a Christian household in the early 1900s. Now, children's animated films are some of the most popular films around. You probably got a favourite childhood film, maybe when you grew up. Um, maybe it's probably perhaps your favourite film of all time. One of my favourite films is The Lion King, but I've also got others. I love A Bug's Life and I love Finding Nemo. I loved watching those when I was growing up. But children's movies in particular, they have this ability to draw people of all sorts of ages and stages of life from all sorts of backgrounds into the lives of characters for just a short while where we feel as though we know them. The silly and the clumsy characters falling over themselves, doing different silly things, is, has kids and laughter. Whilst at the same time, a quick witty line has adults and laughter at the same moment. That's the beauty, I think, of animated films. And, of course, something like The Lion King, there's other films too. Frozen is probably a more recent one. A song or two is thrown into the mix where both children and adults are memorising it and singing along to it. Now, in recent years, online streaming, where you watch movies or TV series online, has grown exponentially. Here's a bit of research that I found out. Since BritBox launched last uh, a couple of years ago, there are over 1 million households that subscribe to it in the UK. That's impressive. Here's the next one. There are over 5 million UK households that have Netflix accounts. That's pretty cool. But then just get over this one. Since Disney Plus launched in November, just a few months ago, there are over 10 million accounts that have been activated. And it's fair to say that online streaming particularly of movies, is what, is, is what consumes popular culture today. It's a topic of discussion so often. Just this last week, I was having a barbecue with a group of friends who aren't yet Christians, and the topic of what we've been watching recently on Netflix came up. We didn't start chatting about Lion King. We started talking about Tiger King. And if you don't know what that is, maybe look it up at another time. But as followers of Jesus, we shouldn't be afraid. We shouldn't stand back or keep at arm's length conversations about what is in popular culture today. Far too often, Christians disengage with what is in popular culture. Look down as, uh, from our nose, from our uh, ivory towers. But what if we flipped it? What if we're prepared to engage in conversations and I'm not saying we should always have deep meaningful conversations about what is in popular culture, but we should at least acknowledge and be ready, as we've been thinking about in our series on 1 Peter, to be able to speak and share something of the faith that we have and how that speaks into popular culture today. Go back to that example This just, just this last week. We were talking about Tiger King, not Lion King. And my fiance was there with me too, Rachel. And we, were, we started the conversation off the back of that, talking about marriage and monogamous relationships. And these people present, they, they've heard their perspective on Christian marriage that they'd never even thought of or considered. And that came from a conversation around popular culture and what we were watching on online streaming. So why are we doing this series about the Lion King? We're not doing it on Tiger King, we're doing it on the Lion King. Well, there's many reasons that we could cite, but the main one I want to, suge I want to put forward to us is that we're wanting the Bible to inform popular culture, not the other way around. Karl Barth, one of the greatest theologians of the last 500 years, let alone the last 100 years, he said this about how Christians are to engage with popular culture. He said, to take your Bible and your newspaper and read both, but interpret newspapers from your Bible. So in our context for this series at the movies in The Lion King, over the next six weeks, our newspaper, inverted commas, is The Lion King and the Bible remains the Bible. The Lion King opens with probably one of the most famous songs of all animated films, The Circle of Life. A few years ago, I was camping uh, at a festival and I was in a huge pub quiz in a giant tent with about four or five hundred people. Uh, and just at a random moment in the quiz, the, the DJ had stuck on the song Circle of Life. 
And then with that, everyone just started singing Circle of Life on all, all the words. I can't remember them in this moment. But you, know, you probably sing along to them now. And then at the point when one of the choruses happens, this, this fellow with his little, like, maybe like six months old baby, he stands up on his chair and he lifts his baby as high as he can. It was brilliant. Everyone was in fits of laughter. The baby had no idea what was going on. He's just sort of innocently looking around, whilst his dad sort of proudly showing him off as everyone's singing along to the circle of life. And that memory, as funny as it is, has stuck with me ever since. Because that moment of that dad lifting that baby as high as he can gives us an insight, I think, into what life is like for all of us. Not just when we're young babies, but also when we grow old. We need help. One of our two short passages we're going to be looking at today is from John 21. John's Gospel, chapter, 20, uh, one, chapter 21. The scene where Jesus is on the beach with Peter... And Jesus is asking Peter a series of questions. The same question, in fact, three times is, Peter, do you love me? He asked it three times for the, for the three times that Peter had denied Jesus before Jesus was killed. This is the same Peter who wrote the letter we've been looking at this term in, that le- in 1 Peter. And after the third time of Jesus asking Peter, do you love me? Here's the words that Jesus says in verse 18 of chapter 21 very truly I tell you when you were younger you dressed yourself and went where you wanted but when you are old you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go life is but the blink of an eye in the scale of eternity should we make it to old age Life in some ways is similar to that when we were babies. Notice the differences that Jesus points out between when you're young and old. When you're young, you dress yourself as a young child, perhaps, maybe clumsily. <laughs> Parents are probably laughing at the, the, the memory of their child or their children dressing in silly costumes. But when you're old, someone dresses you. When you're young, you went where you wanted. When you're old, you're led where you don't want to go. When you're a baby, your parents dress you. When you make it to old age, a relative or a carer dresses you and looks after you. When you were a baby, you went where your parents went. They went to the shops, you went to the shops. They went on holiday, you go on holiday. You were quite possibly driven round to go and do play play dates with your playmates when you're a baby. When you grow old, you can't drive. Someone may take you to the shops or take you on holiday or take you to meet friends. Yes, in these verses, in this verse, in uh, verse 18, Jesus is foretelling Peter's death and the means by which he would die. But he's also, in doing so, reminding him of an important word which I think has been particularly pertinent in the last few weeks and that word's humility. Over the last few weeks as Anne and Tim have brought us into land in our series on 1 Peter, the word that kept on coming up was humility and it's been quite striking. I think it's a word for us to get our heads around and and to, to, to not forget as we go into this summer. And as I was reading this week, the commentaries that I've got around uh, this verse, the word that kept coming up in these different commentators was humility. These are Jesus' words to Peter to humble him and remind Peter that he's not immortal, he's not going to live forever, and he's not going to escape death. You and I are not going to live forever in this life and this flesh and bone that we live in now. As one day we were all born... One day we will all die. Now, seven years ago, when I was uh, at a series of interviews about uh, why I was trying to tell people why I believed God was calling me to get ordained, to become a vicar in the Church of England, they gave me a questionnaire and I had some time to fill it in and lots of different questions. One of the questions was quite stark and quite jarring, in fact. It said, um, write down your date of birth, or sorry, your year of birth, your year of birth or date of birth. So I, 1993, that's when I was born. And it said, write a dash. So I wrote a dash. And then it said, 
below all that, write in inverted commas, in less than 10 words, 10 words or less, write, what would you want your life to be remembered by? Whoa. Like, my word, I mean, I'd only ever, I was only 18 at the time, I'd only ever been asked that question or something similar once before. Never by someone reading a questionnaire that I've never even spoken to. You may have or may not have ever been asked that question. I wonder what you would say to that. How would you want your life to be summarized in 10 words or less? My response, I put this, loved Jesus, loved sport, loved sharing Jesus for his glory. Honestly, it was weird having to write that as if I was dead. But it was awfully humbling that night when I went to bed. It gave me a perspective on life as a gift from God. Life isn't going to last forever. Yes, I was born in 1993. Only God knows how many days I have left in this life. And my life, in that moment on that questionnaire, I had to capture it in 10 words or less. It are 10 words. We might not even get 10 words. It might just sometimes say, 1993 dash, the year that you die, I die. Our life is summarized by a dash. Your life will be captured in the same way. You read news articles of people who have died and they say the year of their, the year of their birth, the dash and the year that they die. Your life will be remembered and captured in the same way. Your dob, your date of birth and your dod, your date of death with a dash in between. What are you doing is my question for us to think about today in the dash. What are you doing with your life now? How are you putting the gifts and the opportunities and the time that God has given you, knowing that life isn't gonna last forever, how are you putting those things to good use? The time that we have now is a gift from our loving creator God who wants us to be with him for eternity. All of us are somewhere in the circle of our lives and we're in, we're in our circle of lives alongside other people and we're not to do it alone. That's why being in community is such an important thing. Peter went and planted churches of communities knowing that at some point along the line he was going to die. Peter, of course, was martyred and killed for his faith. Now, I don't suspect any of us will one day get to that point, although we may do, who knows? But in the dash, what are you doing with it? Should we make it to old age? Should we have grandchildren or great-grandchildren or maybe a whole load of godchildren? What will they say about you and the life that you've lived and the time that you've used to live your life? And you may be a grandparent or a great-grandparent or a great-great-great-grandparent watching this. May this be an encouragement for you today to look back and reflect on your life lived so far and consider all that you've done. And do so with humility for all of us, in fact, whatever age we are today. Humility is such a key word in all of this because our second passage from Revelation 21, the, the very John who wrote John's Gospel, he writes this. Revelation chapter 21, verses 5 to 7. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this and I will be their God and they will be my children. One day, we will all be face to face with the one who was there at the beginning and the end of our lives. And more than that, we'll be face to face with the one who by definition is the beginning and the end. We will cast our crowns and all that we've done in this life before him as he's making all things new. And he will give life in eternity to those who've put their trust and faith in following him in this life. Back to verse 19 of chapter 21 in John's Gospel. 
After Jesus said those words, John writes this. He's, Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to Peter, follow me. Peter said all these different things in his life. He said so many different things. He wrote the letter to one Peter. He wrote second Peter. He wrote hundreds and said countless other words. But Jesus here, well, John is writing capture and saying, this is the life by which Peter is going to be glorified. Now, to glorify is to magnify, to put in absolute focus the thing that is most important in your life. Peter glorified, he magnified, made known to everyone the most important thing in his life was Jesus. And Jesus' words, follow me. Such key words for us to get our heads around. We're in a position in our lives, wherever we're at in our circle of lives, God alone knows. Wherever we're at, in the dash, so to speak, in the dash, we have an ability and an opportunity to give God all the glory that is due unto his name. And it's all in the short scale of our short-lived lives on the vast scale of eternity. Jesus' words, follow me. Peter did follow. Peter made the most of the time that God had given him. And Peter did give God the glory and magnified him in the dash of his life. And Peter did so with humility. So will you follow? Will you give God the glory and magnify him in the dash? And will you do so with humility? We're going to pause for a minute now and reflect and allow God to resonate or speak and put magnify in our own hearts and lives this day. What is he saying to us? So what's God saying to you today? Will you follow? Will you do so humbly? Will you magnify? And will you give God all the glory in the dash of our lives? Amen.